Oh, it's funny, well, just before she got up, we were sitting there, I was sitting there too, thinking about how long we've known you guys. And remember those days when we were just, us and you guys too, were believing God for food on the table three times a day. Hallelujah. God has proved himself faithful again and again and again. Susan and I, we were talking the other day uh, about, uh, I'm trying to think what we were listening to, but it, it was talking about somebody being stable in, in ministry and having consistency and stability and things like that. And it's amazing what the world's definition of stability is, you know, and things like that. And they were, it was reaching out to young ministers about, okay, now you've got to do things so that you maintain a stability. But everything they were telling them was worldly and earthly and how you do finances and da 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 I'm thinking, as he went through the list, I'm thinking, we, we broke all those rules. <laughs> we, we didn't do anything right. Went to the world. Amen. Yeah. And, you know, if, you know, we've been in full-time, I've been in full-time ministry for about 35, coming up on 37 years. Hallelujah. And if you look back, from here backwards, you go, wow, we always paid our bills. We always had enough to do what God's given us yeah. to do, even though a lot of times we went into debt to do what God gave us to do, and then God paid the debt off. And, amen. Come on. So if you look from here backwards, you think, wow, you know, the bruises have been stable, their ministry has been stable and consistent, da, da, da. But if you were at year one, looking this way, at the 37, and going through it, you would think, they're not consistent, they're not stable. Because our, our bank accounts definitely don't prove that. Every year we have a board meeting because we have to. And we have to look at the figures because we're required by the IRS to write them down. So at least once a year we look at everything. And the same thing every year. We put the report of what we did because we have to report that too. All the details of what we did. And then we look at what came in and we go, that doesn't match. So somewhere in the middle of that, God made up. Hallelujah. And if you do what God tells you to do, you're, you're going to be unorthodox, according to the world. And that's one of the things I do really love about coming here, not just the relationship and the friendship and things like that, but also this is one of those places that when I start, when I start packing and start driving here, I'm not going, okay, all right, here we go, what are we going to deal with? It's because we're family, for one, but also I know there's going to be people here who want God. They actually want the word. They actually want to hear from God. And unfortunately, that's not true in every church. There's a lot of churches I go to where I have to kind of go, okay, here we go. Be ready. That never happened here. In fact, what's always happened here is not just like what she mentioned, that God has been gracious and wonderful to pour out a revelation and a move of the Spirit that refreshes you, but we get refreshed. We've always walked away from here with revelation and things we have not had before. So it's, it's a reciprocal thing. Amen? Amen. I appreciate that. Now as we get into the message this morning, I want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer with it just to understand where the message is coming from. And about somewhere coming into the fall, the Lord began to deal with me in prayer. And uh, as He sometimes does with prayer, He... I'll get into prayer and I'm dealing with a bunch of stuff and I'm praying about stuff and it has I'm kind of leaving prayer, which I never really totally leave prayer because I'm always talking with God. But you understand what I'm talking about. A time where I purposely have separated to deal with some things in prayer to hear from God. And as I'm kind of leaving that atmosphere, God says, oh, by the way, something's coming at the church. Get ready. And I remember the first time I heard it, I, I was like waiting for that. Okay, and? And there wasn't any and. You just kind of dropped out of my spirit. And it was that very evening that I was in prayer again, and sure enough, you know, as I'm getting toward the end and I'm kind of closing out and going to go back to do some things in the books and stuff like that, uh, he said, by the way, don't forget, something's coming at the church and you need to be ready for it. And he said that to me several times. And what began to stick with me is that God didn't say something's coming for the church. Come on. Amen. Come on. He didn't say that something's coming to the church. He said something's coming at the church. And I believe we've actually just begun to see the beginnings of it. And, you know, my initial understanding of it was it, it's not a good thing. 
And it's not from God. It's not that God's sending something at us. Hallelujah. It's the devil. It's the world. And we've got to be ready for it. Yeah. Amen. Uh, if you remember, uh, the prophet Agabus uh, talks about in, in the book of Acts where there was a particular time when Agabus got a word from the Lord. And the word from the Lord was, there's a dearth coming. They didn't say God's sending a dearth. Dearth basically meaning uh, a famine. Okay. Uh, when the book of Acts was taking place, 99.5% of all economies was based on agrarian economy, agriculture. Okay? So a dearth, a famine, a time not only of drought, but of the, but of the ground not having nourishment in it, that's going to affect crops. Yeah. That's going to affect cattle. That's going to affect agriculture, an agrarian society. Yeah. So he's saying that's what's coming down the road. Yeah. He said, but when it, you, don't have, you don't have to be affected by it. And so he began to lead them by the Holy Ghost to do things ahead of time that got them prepared and ready to go through it, not just them not be touched by it, but for them to have the excess in their life necessary then to reach out to those who were suffering. Yeah. Okay? And here's how he got them ready. He began to deal with them about the fact that there were the church in Jerusalem and in Judea, the region there, was going through extreme persecution and poverty. So they began to take up what they had, which at that time was not a lot. And they began to sacrificially give and help and support those who were already suffering in Judea and in Jerusalem, the church of Jerusalem. And because they did that for several years, when the dirt hit the world, and by the way, God didn't send it. Amen. Amen. When the dirt hit the world, they were in a position, and actually more correctly, because of what they did, God was in a position yeah. where he could legally bless them in the middle of the dirt. They were blessed to the point that they had more than they'd ever had before. Not only were they able to take care of their own needs, but they were able to not only continue the support and help of Judea and Jerusalem, but they were able to reach out to not only other churches and other places, but they were able to help the world. Yeah. And they were very effectual with the gospel because when everybody else was hurting, they had more than enough. Amen. Not just physically, not just financially, but even spiritually, they had more than enough. And they were able to touch, and they were extremely effective during that time. So now catch this. During the most, and if you look at time, if you study history, I, one of my uh, hobbies, if you want to call it a hobby, I actually I think it's kind of an interest part by God. But I dig into history. I love digging into history. It was really interesting to study history when you know the word. Because yeah. then you begin to see things that the history books have no clue about. Why things really happened. Like the Revolutionary War did not start around the uh, 1770s. You know, and with the signing of Declaration of 1776. On it. The actual Revolutionary War started in the 1750s. 5051. Guess where it started? It was called the Black Road Movement. In other words, it started in pulpits. People preaching about your liberty in Christ. Your rights because of God. Your, uh, your freedoms because just because God has given these rights and privileges. Up. That's what actually sparked it. Well, there is a revolution starting in the earth. It has, start, it has already started. Hallelujah. And it started, and it's coming from the church. And the reason it's coming from the church is because more and more of the church is coming to a realization of who they are in Christ. Right. And what they have, not because I'm a citizen of a country. You know, thank God we're in the United States. Thank God for the Constitution. But if they take the Constitution away, I'm not going to change what I'm doing. Right. Amen. Amen. They can arrest me. They can shoot. In fact, I've been arrested. I've been shot at. Whoopee. So they start doing it in the states. Whoopee. What does that have to do with what God's given me later? Amen. Now, because of the way the times were, they were able to spark a revolution that actually uh, that actually turned into before the revolution. It was called something called the Great Awakening. Yeah. 
Amen. We have going on on the earth, and it may not look like it, because if you watch CNN or even Fox News or any of the other outlets or that, it doesn't look like it. But there is a great awakening going on all over the world. Now here's the really cool part about it. It's happening in the church. It's not so much happening out in the world yet. It is, but not to the level that it's happening in the church. People in the church are waking up. Hallelujah. We've never seen, and I'm talking about personally, uh, I, I, I just did my 82nd nation. Let me ask you one time, you know, is it the years? No, it's not the years, it's the mileage, hallelujah. Yeah. And I'm not done. Hallelujah. I think the UN recognizes 290 nations, something like that, officially, so a little ways to go, praise God. <laughs> Amen. But I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get across to you is it looks like it's getting darker. It looks like it's getting worse. It looks like freedoms and liberties and things are being taken away. You hear about the news about persecution, not just overseas, but even in the state. You hear about people being arrested, being murdered. Uh, I've just lost, again, in this last month, very, very close friends over in Pakistan and the Middle East. Uh, that pastor that's on trial over there, we're not real close friends, but I know him. I know of him. He's, it, he, he's part of the connection of the network that we've had for years, starting churches and getting people saved and, and churches established in Iran. Well, you know, it's we don't know whether he's going to live or not. You know, it, you know, one day they're saying they're going to set him free, the next day they're beating him and they're going to hang him. So that's normal right now for the world. And the economy stinks everywhere, yeah. except in heaven. Amen. And being I'm not from here, now there's a part of me, you know, that my passport has a picture of that guy that's from here. Amen. Several nationalities, actually. I'm quite a mutt. Thank God I'm a new creature in Christ and I only have one identity. But the new creature in Christ who I am, my identity is not of this world. I'm an ambassador to this world. Therefore, my paycheck... And everything, the laws I have, I'm submitted to are not from here. They're from God. Amen. So when I begin to hear something from by the Spirit saying, something's coming at the church. First of all, yeah, I recognize that's not coming from God. What it is, is God alerting me and those who are listening that something's coming and we just need to be ready for it. Yeah. Now, when I began to talk to God about well, what do I need to do to be ready? What do I need to tell the body of Christ to be ready? And he said, really, what you need to tell the body of Christ is to be the body of Christ. Right. Just walk in your walk and you'll be ready for anything. Yeah. The problem is a lot of Christians haven't been walking. Uh -oh. But again, there's an awakening coming on. Amen. And I learned a long time ago that I'm going to walk with God whether everything's going really, really well or everything's going really, really bad. I'm still going to walk with God. In other words... It's not really a good thing to be a reactionary Christian. Amen. Oh, we better start praying when things are getting bad. How about praying when things are good before they get bad? Maybe they won't get bad. Or maybe when the bad comes, it won't touch you as much. Now, by the way, if you think you're going to be living in this body on the earth and not be touched somehow, some way by what's happening on the earth, you are crazy. Right. You're not living in reality. The, the trick is, does it take you down? The trick is, does it stop you? The trick is, does it turn you from your walk with God? Because that's what all of it is about anyway. Amen. The number one reason why the devil attacks the church, if you, if you had to narrow it all, all down to one answer, what is God, I'm sorry, what is the devil trying to stop God or the church from doing? The number one thing that, that the devil tries to do is stop the word from coming forth. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he doesn't care if there's a church. He doesn't care if there's a church that praises God. He doesn't care if there's a church that's full of people who even tithe. I know that hurts him, but he doesn't mind that. What he doesn't want is a church that's preaching the word and not compromising. Because it's the word that changes people's lives. Amen. Now, it's by the power of the Holy Ghost, but if the, if the Holy Ghost doesn't have the Word to work with, there's nothing to work with. Amen. Amen. The Holy Ghost uses the Word and the seed of the Word, and it's the Word that he, that's the image He changes you into. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now, God, for example, with healing, God can touch you with healing power. Thank God for that. Yeah. Thank God for God's mercy. Amen. 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 But if, if, as far as a Christian, if you're going to walk in health and walk in, you know, being able to receive healing, the Word has got to somehow, some way, start getting involved in your life. Right. 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 Amen. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the, th the thing about it is, no matter what's coming, no matter what's happening, we have help beyond this place. Okay. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Now, Brother Rob, what is it exactly that's coming at the church? Well, I'm beginning to see it. It's, it's very, very subtle, very, very disguised. It's not just exterior attack of sickness and financial problems and hardships like that. It's actually very mental. And very emotional. It, it, meaning, the subtlety of it is that it, it isn't something that seems very apparent, but boy, oh boy, oh boy, if it, if it ever gets into you or you let it get into you, it's going to take you down in a very unsubtle or unsubtle way. Right. We're watching people being pulled away from the truth Come on. Come on. like never before. That's true. But that's what Jesus said is going to happen before, yeah. at the end before he comes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But you don't have to be there. Amen. You don't have to be Hallelujah. deceived. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's why you've got to maintain the word. And also you've got to lean on the only help you've got on this planet. Now, who is that? Well, Romans chapter 8, yeah. verse 26. Now, I didn't say any of that to scare you because, uh, again, if the Holy Ghost is, is telling you something, He's not telling you something to get in fear. He's not telling you something, telling us something to get us all upset. It's it just, you know, FYI. Come on. Just thought you want to know an attack is, is coming. So just, well, well, what do we do about it? Don't stop doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's right. Whenever I've been attacked with, that I've gone, God goes, Lord, what do I need to do? He goes, well, there isn't anything new you need to do. Right. It's you right. need to be doing and keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Amen. Because right. yeah. remember, the whole point of the attack is to get you to stop doing right. what you're supposed to be just be doing. That's right. If you stop doing what you're supposed to be doing, he doesn't have to do anything else to attack you. You are taking yourself down. Right, you know, when people get hit with something, people want to say, well, oh, you know, you're going through a hard time, so God understands if you don't come to church. God understands if you stop tithing. God understands if you don't. No, no, no. Yeah, God understands it, all right. God understands you're falling right into the enemy's trap because the enemy knows he can't really take you down. Right. But if he can get you to drop your doing and your faith, he's won. Yeah. Amen. So the best thing you can do when you're going through a hard time is not stop what you're doing in your walk with God. Actually, what you, the best thing you can do is maybe increase it a little bit. Amen. Amen. Oh, but you don't know what I'm going through. And really, to tell the truth, I really don't care the details about what you're going through. Because we all go through it. What I care about is, are you still seeking God? Right. Are you still doing His Word? Are you still doing the thing you're supposed to be doing? Because that's what maintains the benefits in God's presence working on your behalf. Right. It's when you back off those things that the enemy has a door and access to come fully in. It's just because he comes knocking at the door doesn't mean i got to open it. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Amen. 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 You know, symptoms hitting your body is like, like a messenger knocking at the door. Hey, i got a delivery here. Well, you know... I didn't order it. Right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And when the news says the economy is in the tank and going down, well, that's fine. If they want to participate, that's fine. I just choose not to participate. Right. Amen. 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 But I'm also not dumb. I understand that when things are happening in the world, they're real. So I'm going to deal with them understanding they're real. But I know how to deal with them. I don't have to go against the thing. I just have to continue to participate in the answer. Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Now, if I haven't learned anything else in 37 years, I've learned this. Just, just keep going. Uh, right. Amen. Amen. Just keep, just don't stop. Just keep going. Just keep adding on. Just keep listening. 
Do what you're told to do, and everything will be fine. And it has. And it is. And it will be. Do you find Romans 8 yet? Yeah. Verse 26 says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Amen. He helpeth our infirmity by giving us intercession, making intercession forth with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, one big aspect about what he's talking about here, he's literally talking about speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. As in, what he's saying is, uh, look, you've got infirmities. You've got things you can't do. The reason is, is because you're still in the flesh. I mean, figure that one out. Even though your spirit man is brand new, a new creature in Christ, you're still in this body that has not fully been resurrected yet. Amen. The reason is, and don't get all excited at God, because I remember as a young Christian, and I real, began to realize that I initially was not real happy with God. I was like, well, why didn't even you re resurrect my body? Well, if he did, I couldn't do anything here. Because whether you like it or not, that body you're living in is what gives you authority and dominion here. Because your body still has Adam clay in it, Adam dirt in it. Amen. So you're still of that line in that class that has the dominion over all things on the earth that was initially delegated to Adam. Now eventually, that's all going to be removed. In fact, this whole earth is going to be removed. Praise God. We're going to have a new place to live. But in the meantime, we have authority here. The devil doesn't even have that authority. That's all right. Amen. 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 What Adam turned over to him, what Adam allowed him to operate in and have, Jesus has bought that back from him. Hallelujah. Won that back from him. Hallelujah. So the devil, though he has, you know, understanding of things and stuff like that, he doesn't have real power and he does not have real authority. He only has authority if you allow him to have your authority or to use your authority. So when the devil comes to your door wanting to borrow a cup of authority, uh, and just, uh, sorry, don't have any for you. Right. Amen. Yeah. Now here's the other side of the coin that you need to understand. God doesn't have authority here either right now. That's right. Innate in himself. Now, all authority is God, but he's delegated it to man for a time. That's a very patient right. time. For God to do something on the earth now, during this dispensation, someone here has to give him license, give him place. Amen. Amen. Somebody in a, in, a, in, a, in a dirt body, in an atom dirt body. That's why Paul was talking about in Philippians. He said, now no, listen to me. If I leave this body, because the the, my body's not the real Paul. If me, the spirit man, the soul, leave this body, okay, I'm going to go be with Christ, which is great. That's better for me. But it's not going to help you because the second I leave this body, I can't pray for you with authority. I can't, I can't minister to you. I can't preach to you. I can't help you in any way, shape, or form anymore. I lose that ability to do that. Okay? Which is, you know, Mary can't pray for you. Sorry. Joseph can't pray for you. Elliot. Ron can pray for you as long as he's in this body. Amen. 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 Now, when the rapture happens, which I don't believe is that far off, amen, those who've gone on before us are going to come back and their bodies are going to be raised. And they're, and, and they're going to rise first and have resurrected bodies just like their spirit. They're going to be new creature bodies, yeah. even like their spirit. And then we that are on the earth and remain, our bodies are instantly going to be changed. But in the meantime, okay, you're in flesh that's not been resurrected yet. And also you have a bunch of leftover stuff from the old man. So if you read Romans, you can actually go back to Romans 1, but in particular Romans 4 through chapter 8, Paul's talking about this continuous battle we have. Is My spirit man is brand new, complete in Christ, wants to obey God, wants to follow God, knows the will of God, here we go. But when he steps out to want to do everything, there's something left over in the flesh that goes, no, we want to do this. Right. So there's, there's a fight between the spirit and the flesh. That's true. Yeah. In, in fact, real spiritual warfare is not you and the devil. Right. 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 Real spiritual warfare is you and you. Right. 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 New man, old man. Right. In fact, when you read the New Testament, the only time 
war or warfare is mentioned. The only time it's ever mentioned. It never once says anything about demons. Now understand, we are fighting demons, in, in a sense. There is a war going on, so to speak, for the heavenlies. Amen. But, but really, to tell the truth, the war's been won. We're not fighting a war against the enemy. We're occupying. We're occupying a territory with a defeated foe. You know, my father was just young enough that he missed World War II as far as the actual fighting. But within a year, he was in Germany as an occupational soldier. Now, he had the uniform, he had the weapon, they had tanks, they had, you know, the whole bit. But they weren't fighting a war to win the war. They were enforcing the victory. Now, he had just as many weapons and just as much authority and everything as the, the army that actually fought the war. But they weren't fighting the war to win the war. They were enforcing a victory. That's what we're doing. In fact, in Luke, Jesus talks about, I told a parable about... Uh, someone coming, turning stuff over to his servants and going into a far country for a time, which is what Jesus has done. And he says to his servants, hello, us, yeah. occupy. Amen. The word occupy there in those verses means to busy oneself with. Sounds like doing, doesn't it? Right. Busy oneself with what? The kingdom. <laughs> Amen. Occupy till, he, till I come, he said. So until the rapture happens, be busy. Yeah. I don't think the rapture has happened yet, because I'm still here. Uh, Somebody asked me one time, well, how, how are we going to know when the rapture has happened? I said, well, when you don't see me no more. <laughs> <laughs> you might be living behind, but I'm not living behind. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the, there's a struggle and a battle of trying to walk in the Spirit, trying to stay in the Spirit, trying to do the things of God, because even in our own members, there's memory of the old man that's trying to pull us off and do all the other things. And a lot of what's coming at the church and in the world is to pull us into the flesh, to pull us into the natural, to pull us into politics. Which, by the way, the word politics means wars. Politics is war without violence. I've heard it said this way, politics is war on the edge of violence. But once it goes to violence, it's not politics anymore, it's war. But it's the war of the world. Politics is the war of the world. So nothing's going to be won kingdom-wise through politics. I didn't tell you not to vote. I just said don't put your faith in it. Amen. Amen. Our faith, what's really going to pull us through is not going to be politics. What's going to pull us through is walking in the spirit yeah. in the kingdom. Because right. you know what? It doesn't matter who's president, who's senator, who's congressman, who's the judge. It matters who's Lord. Yeah. And that kind of already been established before you even had a vote, thank God. There was, there was an election, by the way, for Lord of all. The Father voted, chose Jesus as Lord of all, and that's it. Amen. Hallelujah. He's not up for re-election, by the way. Let me ask you one time, were there term limits in heaven? Yeah, there's term limits in heaven. There's only one term, but this term is for eternity. So, yeah. Amen. 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 If we're going to deal with what's coming at the church and just walk with God, what we're going to have to do is stay in the Spirit. Right. Well, the problem is we're, we're, we're in the Spirit. We have the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit, but there's a part of us that's still in the flesh, and we have blinders. How many of you realize that you're blinded to certain things? Like, how many of you know what's going to happen in the future? I know the Bible tells us something about the future. How many of you know it's going to happen in 10 minutes? I got notes and that doesn't mean nothing. I have no clue. Because I'm listening to the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, so part of, you know, he gets into this long discussion. Then he says, but the Holy Ghost helps our infirmities. And the word infirmities there, by the way, doesn't mean sickness or disease. It means inability. Literally, it means feebleness. Meaning... There are all kinds of things that you cannot do because you're in the flesh. You're in a body. In fact, Romans 6 talks about uh, that our, you know, though we live in this mortal body, which means a body that's subject to death. It's subject to limitations. Amen? How many of you realize that? Figure that one out. How many of you can walk through walls? 
Now, I can walk through a wall, I could run through a wall, I'd hurt myself. But if it's a solid concrete wall, I don't think I'm making it. Jesus is in a resurrected body that doesn't, you know, it's not hindered by things like that. Face time, walking, you know, walk. We're going to have bodies like that too. But in the meantime, we're limited by things. Well, the Holy Ghost helps our infirmities, our limitations, our weaknesses. Now, again, and he points out one specifically right here and says, for example, you know you need to be saying, you know you need to be praying, but the problem is you don't always know what to say or pray. Right. Yeah. Like when he's coming at me and going, now, there's something coming at the church, you need to be ready for it. Well, one thing I want to do is start praying about it. Yeah. Well, if that's the only information I got, my details in English are going to be very limited. But the Holy Ghost knows everything. He, he not only knows everything, but he knows the Father's will perfectly. Yeah. So he says, here's what we're going to do. You need to pray and you need to be saying, because when you pray and you say, you give authority. Whether it's God, whether it's the devil, whether it's whatever. Okay. So God wants to move on your behalf. God wants to do things and accomplish things. But you need to be saying the right thing and praying the right thing. The problem is you don't always need to know what to say or pray. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you utterance. Now we're talking about he maketh intercession. Uh, in the Greek it talks about he, he gives unto us syllables. It doesn't even say words. He gives us syllables. Which, boy, that really helps you when you understand that tongues doesn't always sound like you're speaking words. It sounds like you're just uttering out syllables. That's what you're doing. He says, I'm going to give you syllables to syllable. Or to utter out. When you utter them out, you're speaking, if you read a few more verses, you're speaking the perfect will of God. Yeah. And the Father knows what the Holy Ghost is trying to say through you. So if you don't understand it, or you don't think that what you're saying is making any sense, it doesn't matter. The Father knows what's coming through you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And because you don't know what you're saying, you can't mess it up. Right. <laughs> You know, you can't add to it. You can't take away from it. You ain't got any clue what you're saying to begin with. Now, you may get interpretation, but you don't have to. Right. Amen. Now, notice it says he gives us utterings and syllables which cannot be uttered. Now, when it says that, people say, well, you know, that sometimes people can't say it. Now, it's not that we can't say it. It's the Holy Ghost can't say them. Now, the Holy Ghost can speak. He's got a voice. He can speak. What it's saying is he can't utter these things with authority here. Because the Holy Ghost doesn't have a body. Does he? No. But you've got one. With Adam dirt in it. So he's saying, look, I know what to say, but I ain't got a mouth with authority to say it. you got a mouth with authority that can say some things and change some things, but you don't know what to say. So let's get together. I'll give you the word. You give me your mouth. Just utter it. If I could tell you how many times I've been woken up in the middle of the night, you know, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I wake up and I realize it's the Lord, and here's all I hear from the Lord. I need your mouth. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's the whole conversation. I need your mouth. So here's what I do. All right, Father, in Jesus' name. And I just pray in tongues until I have a peace or a release. That either, okay, it's okay to go to sleep, or maybe I'll pick this up another time, or, or I've got the answer. And then it's like, all right, good night. Amen. Amen. Well, what did you pray? It might be none of my business. He might be having me pray about you. I don't need to know your business. I just need to give him my mouth. Amen. Now, that's one area. But there's all kinds of areas we're weak in, we're feeble in. For example, when you do get attacked with, with symptoms, Amen. Now you've got to stand. Now you've got to fight the good fight of faith. And really, the, the fight of faith is not fighting something. The, the, the good fight of faith is staying in faith. That's the fight. Not dropping your belief, not dropping your confession. Amen. Well, the Holy Ghost will help you in anything you've got to deal with. Anything you've got to come up with. Look, look with me real quickly at the... If, if you can't turn there fast, and I'll just write the references down. Acts 10.38... Jesus, when he came to the earth, he was a mere man. He stripped himself of all his power, all his rights, all his glory, his being. Man. In fact, you know, Jesus didn't, 
you know, get born in, the, in Bethlehem in the stable and then sit up in the manger and start preaching. You know, he didn't get out, you know, crawl out of the manger and go pray for the shepherds who were sick or something like that. He was a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Right. And as I heard one old preacher say one time, you know, I, I rest assured, knowing he's a newborn babe, he probably pooped in his swaddling clothes. And they didn't have pampers. Or huggies or whatever the current brand is. And then we're, we're past the children having diapers and we haven't hit the grandchildren stage yet, so we're, we don't know what's on the market. Amen. Oh, how many, you know what a swaddling clothes swaddling is? How many of you realize what that is? Some people think swaddling clothes is some kind of like blanket or something like that. The swaddling cloth was the towel or the cloth that they used to wipe the sweat off the horses. That's his first onesie. Mmm. Makes you just want to pick him up and hug him, doesn't it? The point is, Jesus came and became a mere man. Jesus found out who he was because Jesus did, he wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost when he was born, but he was born of the Spirit, he had the Spirit. He began to realize who he was because he was brought up hearing the Word. And he began to find out who he was by getting revelation from the word he was reading and meditating and studying. And he began to see, and I said, that's me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Just like you find out who you are and what you're called to do by seeing yourself and finding yourself in the word by the Holy Spirit. Now, when he began to realize his ministry, he stepped out to, at the right time to obey God and step into ministry. But before he began to minister, because he had not taught, he had not ministered healing, he would not done miracles, not done anything before the age of 30. And when he realizes he's got to step into ministry, he goes to the river Jordan to be baptized of John in the water, which is the type of like being born again, being born in the Spirit. Now, he didn't need to do that. He did that as our example, as our substitute. But immediately coming out, the Bible says he was filled with the Holy Ghost, that the Father poured the Holy Ghost and the anointing upon him. Amen? Yeah. After going through the wilderness and time, uh, being tempted, he came back, it says, Luke says, he came back in the power of the Spirit. Now, in Acts 10, 38, Peter gives a good explanation of what happened. He says how God anointed the, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth is the man. Jesus of Nazareth was the just like you and me, limited by the natural, limited by the flesh. Amen? So he, he baptized or anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So he was able to start ministering. He was able to start preaching. He was able to start teaching. He was able to start ministering healing and miracles and things like that because he was anointed with the help of the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Ghost coming upon him with power, Jesus would not have been able to do any of those things. Amen. Amen. The Father was able to work and do things through him because of the Holy Ghost coming upon him and Jesus yielding to the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus began, even during the three years of his ministry, we find out there's things Jesus didn't know. He only knew things that the Holy Spirit revealed them to him. And the, probably the most classic example is, is uh, Mark chapter 5 when Jairus comes up to him totally taking him by surprise. He thought he was wrapping everything up and going into Capernaum, going to rest. And all of a sudden this guy stops him, uses his faith. Jesus drops everything and starts following him. Jesus didn't wake up that morning and cross earth. Hey, boys, now when we get to the other side, there's going to be this guy named J.I. who's going to come and ask me to you know, come to his house. He didn't know that. Come on now. And then while he's following J.I., this impertinent woman just interrupts his entire day. Comes up, touch, doesn't he touch him, touches the hem of his garment. Jesus is stopped in his tracks and, and says, who touched him? Come on. He didn't know that somebody touched him. What he knew was <clears throat> that power, that anointing had gone out of him. And it doesn't go out of him unless it goes to do something. So then he's looking around going, all right, who touched me? Who took the power? And of course the disciples say, uh, Jesus, the whole town's touching you. <laughs> what he meant was somebody's touching me in faith. Somebody got power and he finds out it's the woman. He didn't turn around and say, now, woman, I knew you were coming. 
I, you know, I knew that this was your day. I had it marked on my calendar since I was a little kid. Uh, so and so day, the woman with an issue is coming. <laughs> down, 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 down. He didn't know that until she touched him. Right, right. Amen. So in those ways, Jesus operated the same way we do. In a lot of ways, he was blind to things unless the Holy Ghost gave him revelation, gave him help, gave him strength, gave him ability. See, I'm really convinced that Jesus did not begin to get the full picture of what he had to do as our substitute dying on the cross and being separated from the Father till the very end. I think he was spared from that. He began to realize, began to see that. But boy, in the garden, he got full revelation of what it was going to take. And that's when he started going, um, can, can we maybe do this another way? I mean, I'm willing to do it your way, Father, but you know, can we pass this cup and maybe take another one? Hallelujah. Yeah. See, I think as he was walking and he began to share with his disciples things like, hey, you know, uh, the Son of Man must die, but in three days he'll rise again. I think when he was starting to share it with his disciples is when he was starting to get revelation. Timing. Yeah, yeah. Timing is, God has such perfect timing with yeah. the Holy Ghost. But no matter what, what's coming, the Holy Ghost will help you. Yeah. Not just have an understanding of things, but get you through things. Right. In fact, the Holy Ghost can get you through things even if you don't totally understand the situation. Because right. I don't need to. Right. Here's what I need to understand. Okay, what's my do? Yeah. What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? To tell the truth, God, please don't complicate it by telling me all the details. <laughs> Okay, I'll let you handle all of that. Just give me my what to say and my what to do. A lot of you have trouble with situations because you think you've got to know every little detail of why this is happening. And da, 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 da. That's what gets you into the mental realm, the emotional right. realm, and the sense realm, and the right. devil wipes you up, wipes up the floor with you. Yeah, that's true. That's and true. the words are rocky. Yeah. Amen. 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 When God's got you know, one reason I know why God, that God called me into ministry is because God uses the, the simple, plain things, right. the foolish things of the world. And God figured, I, I, I know when God, before the foundation of the world, was looking down through history for somebody to pick to be a teacher that traveled around the world explaining the gospel. I knew he picked me because, you know what, if Ron can get it, anybody can get it. I know that's one reason why he picked me. You know, if I can explain it to Ron and Ron gets it, then anybody can understand it. Amen. Amen. So the Holy Ghost will help Jesus. Well, if he helped him minister and do all those things, he'll help you minister and do all those things. And he'll help you know and understand things that you don't know and couldn't know any other way other than him giving you revelation. Hallelujah. By the help of the Holy Ghost, you, you can begin to walk in things that haven't even begun to happen. Now that's how we're really supposed to be walking. We're supposed to start walking in things that haven't even begun to occur yet so that when the things occur, we're already walking in what we need to be walking in to get through it. See, God's not, okay, when you're in the middle of the crisis, I'll rescue you. Now, he will, but that's not his style. <laughs> Amen. Here's Jesus' style. Start doing this. Why? Just start doing it. But it doesn't make any sense. Just start doing it. Because all of a sudden things are going to start happening and you're already going to be not just beginning to do it, but it's going to be an established thing in your life. When the thing happens, you're going to go, ah, that's why he wants me to be doing this. But see, if he hadn't had you start doing it before it made any sense, now in the middle of it, that's the hardest time to start getting established in something when you're in the crisis. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Understand part of what the message is this morning. God's wanting you to get you, get you ready yeah. and get you starting to walk in something. Or if you've been walking in it and gotten away, if you've been walking in it, keep walking in it. Uh -huh. But if you've gotten away from it, get back in it. Because when this thing really, really starts coming at the church, if you're not already walking it, it's going to be real hard to pick up and start going. Wow. You know, reading the word, getting scriptures on healing, find out that healing belongs to you. It's, your, it's yours because you're a child of God. It, he's already bought it for you. You're already healed by the stripes of Christ. Getting that, meditating on it, getting that truth in you, getting it, confession, and you believing it and walking in it is easier before the symptoms hit. Before the doctor's report hit. Now, it's not impossible once the symptoms hit, once the doctor's report comes, but boy, it's harder. Amen. It's a lot easier to get the truth and start praising God for healing and for health and whatever before anything hurts. Because when it hits, you're already established. And you just keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. 
Good. Hallelujah. Amen. Second, and again, if, if you can't turn to him, just listen and write, write the references down. Second Timothy, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Very familiar first verse for a lot of people. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Amen. Now, before you get all excited about this verse, let me explain something to you. In context of this letter, this is not an, this is not a exhortation. Meaning, you know, woo -hoo -hoo! Oh, Timothy, isn't it great? Actually, this is somewhat of a rebuke. Here's the context of the letter. Here's why the letter was even written in the first place. Timothy had been sent somewhere to be the apostle of the city, so to speak, to continue laying the foundation and basically operate as the pastor because of persecution and hard times. Now, let's, let's, let's talk about the level of persecution. They were throwing people to lions. They were taking Christians alive, strapping them to poles, greasing them up, putting them in the ground along the side of the streets, and when the sun set, they lit the Christians for nightlights, for streetlights. That's right. Okay, that's the persecution that's going on. If you, if you were a Christian, they persecuted you. If it was found out that you were an association or knew Paul, who at that time was under arrest in prison, you got persecuted. So Timothy, who went there, gangbusters, bold, and the beginning was very bold establishing, backed off to the point where not only was he not preaching, he was literally denying that he even knew who Paul was and any other association. Now you can kind of understand the pressure he was under right now. Christian being lit up as nightlights and you know, just a little bit of persecution. Not like we go through in the state. He looked, when I when he found out I was a Christian, he gave me a look. They told me I can't bring my Bible to school. I went through that. Just to tell you, by the way, kids, if you're in public school, according to the Constitution, you can preach Jesus. Yeah. You can pray out loud. Yes. You can carry a Bible. It's your constitutional right. I can't walk into the school and start preaching. Uh, Which actually, I'm, in one way, I'm glad for that because I don't want a cleric from the Muslim faith to walk in and start preaching. I don't want a Mormon to walk in and start preaching. Amen. But if you're a Christian and, and you want to tell other people about Jesus, including your teachers, it's your constitutional right. But you know what? Even if it wasn't, I do. I remember in the 10th grade, 10th grade English, Mrs. Underdome. This lady should have retired about 20 years before I had her in my had a class. She was way beyond retirement age. I mean, bless her heart. I mean, she'll do good. So at, at this time, I'm really, I had just gotten filled with the Holy Ghost, which was a mess because I wasn't in the church. Just gotten a hold of a Bible, probably about a month before that. So I'm reading scripture for the first time, and I've already been filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm excited. I'm ready to die for Jesus. Nah, 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 nah. And we're going on and on. I'm telling people about Jesus and school and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, she, you know, she's telling us about Beowulf. We're studying Beowulf, which is supposedly the oldest piece of written literature in existence. Well, I got news for them. There's others. But anyway. But we're studying Beowulf, and she throws out the question. About, you know, how did uh, Beowulf's relationship with his mother affect his rulership when he ruled? Now this is, she throws, in, and then she, you know, people raise their hand, but then, I didn't raise my hand, but she picked me anyway. Mistake. So, now, I would read the story, but, you know, I was just, at that point, I'm so tired of hearing mythology and, you know, false oh, god. And, uh, so she said, so... She asked me the question, and, I said, and my answer was, well, what does that have to do with the fact that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell and burn for eternity? <laughs> a lot of zeal. Not necessarily a lot of wisdom, but boy, a lot of zeal. But, you know, the more and more I look back on it, I don't think it was necessarily lack of wisdom. I think I was a band of the Lord. Because here's what happened. Oh, I got in all kinds of trouble. Now, my parents were not Christians, but my mother was a big Bavarian woman who had escaped Hitler's regime and the Soviets. 
And so when I got pulled into the vice principal's office and she got pulled into the vice principal's office and he starts yelling about, you know, I can't, whatever, like that. My mother actually reached across the desk, grabbed the vice principal by the tie and said, my son can do whatever he wants to do. As long as he's not hurting anybody, shooting anybody, or killing anybody, he can do as he pleases, right? <laughs> and the vice principal said, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Now, I did have to promise that I would never, you know, tell the teacher she was going to help. Which, I guess, in a way, I was saying that. But I was just stating a fact. Now, here's the really interesting thing. After that was all, everything so-called so calmed down, blew over, whatever the terminology is. About three days later, within three days later, within two days, seven students in that class came to me personally. Wow. Wow. And said, I can't get your words out of it. One girl told me, I can't get your words out of my head. Yeah. Is that true? And I told them true. Two of them walked away. I'm going to consider that. I'm going to consider those words. Five of them got saved. Amen. Wow. Don't clap. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's good. Amen. But that fervor in one way never left me. Hallelujah. But part of the reason it never left me is because after getting the Holy Ghost, I started living differently. Yeah. And I got to the point where I couldn't be ashamed of God. Oh, yeah. And he's <laughs> writing this letter to Timothy because he's basically, he's not, he's not encouraging Timothy, he's rebuking him. It's like, let me see if I can put it in modern language. Excuse me? Yeah. Excuse me? You're not ministering? You're not preaching? You're actually denying you know me or any of the other brethren? Excuse me? God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now look at the next verse. Yeah. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. That's not an encouragement. That was a rebuke, which encouraged him. <laughs> Amen. But be, now, 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 now here's the kicker. Here's the point people miss. The people will read that like that if you get that and they say, see, no matter what happened, you just got to put up with it, Timothy. I, 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 I. Let's read on. Don't be ashamed. Don't back off the gospel. But don't do it by yourself and in your own strength. Right. Amen. Amen. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. According to the power of God. Hallelujah. So it's not, you know, we just have to take persecution. Well, no. <laughs> I'm going to endure affliction by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, now let me tell you, give you uh, something that was really interesting. From that particular period and where he was. Anybody ever heard of Nero? Yeah. Matt Nero. Now, personally, I think Nero was insane already. <laughs> Amen. But history tries to teach that he became insane, and here's why they think he became insane. In other words, to me, it's the thing that put him over the edge. I think he was already <laughs> over the edge, but like really shoved him over the edge. Somebody told him that after they pulled the bodies down from being burned and the lions and that, that if they could see the face, that it had the most unbelievable look upon the face. Now that, that gave him, you know, piqued his curiosity. So he went out one night by, by lamp or, or torchlight, went into the arena and found the places where Christians had been slaughtered or killed by lions or like that, and if they had a face left, they had the most glowing look and smile and satisfaction, rest and peace on their face. And he, he can't understand. I, look what I'm doing to them, and the last look on their face is peace and happiness and rest. And they said over about four nights of doing that, of seeing, you know, body after body after body of that, it put him over the edge. He couldn't understand why. I understand why. But like Stephen, tell me all you want. I'm going, I see Jesus standing up at the right hand of God. Welcome in me home. Go ahead, throw the rocks. I don't think Stephen felt a thing. I, I've read stories over in, in Russia of priests and ministers and monks who preach in the gospel 
And they grabbed them and tied them to stakes to burn them alive. And they just keep preaching the gospel. And while the fire is burning their flesh, they just keep happily, boldly preaching the gospel. While they're being consumed by the flame. And I wonder how in the world they did that. Come on. Yeah. Amen? By the power yeah. of the Spirit. Yeah. Well, Brother Ron, you don't know what's coming against me. By the power of the Spirit. Yeah. Right. You don't know what's happening. I, I just can't handle this. We know. Yeah. Therefore, by the power of the yeah, Spirit. Right. Now, I'm not planning on handling anything that's coming at the church. <laughs> what I'm planning on doing is doing exactly what he tells me to do. So I'm in the Spirit and in the Word. And by faith and the power of the Spirit, I will endure everything. Right. And endure doesn't mean, you know, I just... Make it through. No, I'm victoriously going through. Amen. And if it isn't my time to go yet, I'm not dying. Now I'm talking at, I'm talking at extremes. But if God will do this and the Holy Ghost will do this at extremes, what about with what you're dealing with right now today? Pressure at work, pressure at school, pressure from a family member, pressure from a spouse. And Jesus said, in those days, he said that your enemies aren't going to be just people in the world of the devil. They're going to be people in your own house. Why? Because you walk with me, he says. Right. I mean, the more you walk with me, the more I'm a parent. And the more I'm a parent, if they don't want to walk with me, you're going to aggravate them. Guess who they're going to take it out on? And why are they taking it out on you? Because they want you to back off Christ. Why? So that Christ isn't so apparent in their life. I'm not backing off. I'm no. just going to uh, even more. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Good. Let's go through some more verses real quick. Romans 15, verse 18, 19 says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. There's the kick. By the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I said it right. I have fully preached the gospel. You're not fully preaching the gospel unless you do it with the full power and measure of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, who, who is this available to? Well, Galatians 3, 13, 14 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Amen. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Right. That the blessings of Abraham <laughs> might come on the Gentiles. Now, catch the next part. And that we might receive the promise of the Spirit yeah. through faith. Amen. So who's the Holy Ghost available to? Everybody. Yeah. Amen. Even sinners. Yeah. You can be born of the Spirit. But then, of course, after you're born of the Spirit, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost right. and power. Yield more completely to Him. The Holy Ghost help is available to us today. Amen. And not just to ministers, so to speak. Because actually, tell the truth, we're all ministers. Amen. If you're in a body, you got a mouth, you got hands, you're a minister. Hallelujah. You're a servant of God. Hallelujah. In fact, the Bible says you've been set free from sin to be a servant of God. Right. Okay? Now that word, in, uh, if you want to go back there to uh, Romans 8 again. Romans 8, 26. He said, the, whole, the Holy Ghost helpeth our infirmities. Well, that's our weaknesses, our feebleness, our, our inabilities. Amen? But if, notice he says he helpeth our infirmities. Now, the Greek word translated helpeth, it's actually not a word, it's a phrase word. The Greek language is really interesting. They have words, then they have phrases, then they have story phrases. So in order, in order to understand what the Greek language, uh, in one way, you've got to understand Greek history, because a word is based is the title of a story in Greek history, and if you know the story in Greek history, you know what the word means. Otherwise, you're like, uh... Amen. Anyway, here's, here's a phrase word that's translated helpeth, but here's what it literally translated from the Greek. Are you ready for it? Yeah. The Holy Ghost helpeth our inabilities, our infirmities. It literally means to take hold together with against. And it's one of those 30-letter Greek words I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. You can look it up yourself. 
Amen. But it literally means to take hold, together with, against. Now the against is referring to a weight, a pressure. Now for example, just, just for illustration purposes, this just, just worked really well for understanding. Imagine a wagon. Have you ever seen a western? Like a covered wagon going across the Asia. So you got a wagon, and it's full of heavy weight. Well, that weight's got to be pulled. So the way that you pull the weight is something has to be harnessed, strapped to the harness, and puts its weight against, see, against the weight. And then that starts to pull it. That starts to move it. That starts to direct it. Okay. Now, harness normally has a minimum of two. So here's the thing. You're dealing with things in the world. You've got these things that you've got to pull. You've got to move. You've got to either get going in the right direction or you've got to get, stop them from going in the wrong direction, whatever it is, okay? You're a Shetland. You know what a Shetland is? Shetland pony? The smallest horse in the world. We, we just recently been seen as funny. We've been seeing them. We, we were up in upper New York State, and we actually went by a farm that had llamas, sheep, goats, like that, and all of a sudden, we passed a Shetland <coughs> farm. There's all these little Shetland ponies running around. In fact, we saw one the other day, didn't we, driving up here. What's the smallest one? Well, that's you. There ain't no way you're going to pull away. Okay? But you're not in the harness by yourself. You're yoked together with. Now, who you're yoked together with it's Jesus, but in reality, the, God, the part of the Godhead that's with you here is the Holy Ghost. He's in you and, and, and can be upon you and pull it. That's who you're harnessed with. Now, the way the harness is, it's not a neck harness. A lot of people think of the harness or the yoke just being around the neck. It's strapped around the body. Okay. Now, the one next to you, the Holy Ghost, so you're the Shetland. Yeah. He's a Clydesdale. He's a Bavarian. Big dude. <laughs> Difference between a regular horse and a Clydesdale? Regular horse, horseshoe is about that big. Okay? Clydesdale's like that. Wow. Average Clydesdale is 16, 17 inches diameter shoe. Wow. Big horse. I remember one summer I worked in Bush Gardens and part of my duties every about two days a week I got to help them early, early in the morning, groom the horses, got them ready to be out for people to see about that. And this this Mayor, she didn't do it on purpose, but she sta I'm standing there and I'm getting the under part of her neck untangled, you know, brushing it out right there. So I'm underneath her, just like that brush right there. And she's just, she's kind of moving her head, and you can tell she's liking it. But she's standing like this, with one knee kind of bent up. And she didn't mean it, but just because of leaning or whatever, she, I think she got a little unbalanced, and so she cantered. Just like that. Well, my foot was there. So just that little... That little shift of weight broke all my metatarsals. Oh. Literally bent the steel boot into my foot. Oh. I forgave her. Amen. Oh. I was, I was, amen. But just that memory, you know, <laughs> she didn't mean to. Okay. So there you are harnessed together. Now here's the trick. Because of the way authority is, the Holy Ghost, the Clydesdale, is in what is considered a standby condition, meaning... The, the shoulders are dropped, the head is down, and the knees are at what's rest. It's kind of a locked position, but they're at rest, which means the body's down. Because of that, the harness is down, and your feet are on the ground. Now, the Holy Ghost can't initiate anything. doesn't have authority to do that. You're the one who has authority to license or give authority or initiate stuff. So when you initiate, which means you put your weight into something, which means you start praying, you start speaking, you start doing something. You, you put your weight against that weight, which doesn't do anything. Amen. But that gives your partner the ability to begin to be part of the initiation, be part of what you're doing. So the first thing that horse, that the Clydesdale does, is stand up. Well, when he does, the harness goes up. So basically, here you are. <laughs> You're not even touching the ground. You, in your ability strength, aren't doing anything other than by continuously moving, you're giving place and authority for the Clydesdale to be engaged. Yeah. For the Holy Ghost to be engaged. The minute you stop praying, you stop saying, you stop being, you stop believing, the Clydesdale has to disengage. 
Okay? Now, once he starts pulling, this one, what, what, what can't he pull? What can't he handle? What can't he do? So we've got to initiate. Now, most people would agree that I don't initiate things. I instigate things. Either way, I get things started. Normally, when I obey God, it doesn't look like I'm initiating something. It looks like I'm instigating something, which I am. Something isn't happening or something's happening that isn't right. And somebody needs to instigate something to get, correct this mess. Right. Get the Holy Ghost involved. Right. So you just, you, you make that initial pull, the initial movement. He rears up and now you just keep going and he pulls the weight. He helps it. He takes care of it. He takes hold together with against. Now the key, the key phrase there is together with. Yeah. Because the Holy Ghost will never... Come against something. He can't. But he'll always, with you, if you obey God, do the word, speak the word, yield to him, he will always take hold together with you against. But you've got to take hold first. Now, go to Romans 8 and we'll close with this. You guys all right? By the way, the way Romans 8 is in the King James Bible is the original Greek. Because I know there's some translations that want to remove some of these verses and say they're not in the original. Well, you know, what's, what's really bad about that is that if you read it in proper context, then it matches the rest of the Bible. So even if you take these verse, some of these verses out, the rest of the Bible still says it. it does. Amen. Verse 1 says, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now here's the kick. You have an option. Flesh, Spirit. Now, God's not going to condemn you. And eternally, as a Christian, you've been declared righteous. That's what justified means. You're, here's God's proclamation, not I condemn you. His proclamation is righteous. Made righteous in Christ. Okay? But in walking in this world and dealing with your soul and your body, if you walk in the flesh, the world's going to condemn you, the, uh, Satan's going to condemn you, but also your own heart will condemn you. Yes. Now the Holy Ghost won't condemn you, He will convince you. Uh, excuse me, this isn't right. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But the choice is yours. He's going to help you make the right decision. But the choice is through yours. So if you walk in the Spirit and not walk in the flesh, and by the way, the way you not walk in the flesh is to choose to walk in the Spirit. The way you don't do it, don't, is by making sure you do a do. So as one of my friends always says, make sure you're always do-do. You always make sure you do-do. Do your do. You'll, you'll never get in trouble. Alright, next verse. For the woman, I'm, I'm sorry. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. Because of what Jesus did, the flesh can't make you follow. Satan can't make you follow him. But also remember, God can't make you follow him. You're just free from his ability to make you follow him. So in other words, because of what Jesus did, you're free to make the right choice. But you've got to still make the choice. Yeah, you do. Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and poor sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Thank God he did. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. You, if you'll walk after the spirit, you'll fulfill and manifest the fruits of righteousness. Following the law couldn't do that. But if you walk in the Spirit through Christ, you can fulfill and manifest the fruits of righteousness. Hallelujah. But it's still a choice. Hallelujah. Verse 5. Now, somebody asked me, well, what's, what is the difference between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh? Well, there's all kinds of, you know, we could be here for a seminar for five weeks and I could every day and teach you all the different things. But he put it in this one little phrase here that just so capsulizes everything. You ready for it? They that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. Think about, talk about, desire, 
Go after it. You do that, mind the things of the flesh, guess what you're going to be doing? You're going to be walking in the flesh. But, thank God for conjunctions. But they that are after the spirit, now the connotation in the Greek and, and in the you know, translation of grammar, we can put in there. But, the, but, but those that are after the spirit, mind the things of the spirit. So if you're thinking about paying attention to, seeking after, setting up to walk after the spirit, guess what you're going to do? You're, you're going to walk in the spirit. But if you don't mind the things of the spirit, whether you like it or not, you're going to end up walking in the flesh. That's where you, you know, I'll just throw a few scriptures at you. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. In everything you're going to do, make sure you think about the kingdom first. And you'll be minding the things of the Spirit, and he'll help you, whatever. Now, how does the Holy Ghost help us know what, well, let me, let me finish reading it. For to be carnally minded is death. That's thinking with a five pound piece of ham between your ears. How many of you know that thing between your ears called the brain is just a big piece of ham? And there's people all over the world and in church who are trying to find, figure out the, the God of the universe with a piece of ham. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get very far. No wonder you got, you know, Archie Bunker always, whenever Mike, remember all in the family? Yeah. Whenever Mike especially went on his rampage about you know, being an atheist, there is no God, no, 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 no. Archie's rebuttal would always be, you meet him. <laughs> and he's right. He's calling them a meathead. You're trying to think, figure out whether there even is a God with your head, which is a piece of meat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Next time you're at the grocery store, go to the frozen food section, look at one of the 10-pound hams and ask it, is there a God? Uh, <laughs> that's about as much luck you're going to have with your piece of meat trying to figure out if there's a God or understand right. God. Right. Which is true. why we don't know God by our head and by intellect. We know God by the Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So to be carnally minded, to be after the intellect, the mind, natural things, trying to figure things out and walk in the spirit after natural things, notice what he says. To be carnally minded is death. The word death always means separation. It's a separation from revelation, blessings of God, knowledge of God, knowing God, being led by the spirit. You mind it, you be carnally minded, that's where you're going to be. I don't care if you're a spiritual Christian. If you're carnally minded by anything, you're going to experience death, separation from these things. But, ooh, thanks for the conjunction, God. But to be spiritually minded, let me put the spirit first, is what? Life and peace. Last time I checked, life and peace is not the same as condemnation. Right. But remember, condemnation is not coming from God. It's going to come from your own heart. It's going to come from your realization that you're not walking like you should be. And you can't lie to yourself either. No, you can't. Amen. But you don't have to. You can have life and peace. Yeah, if you have life and peace, you can hear. Yeah. So put, for, put first the things of the Spirit. Well, how do I know exactly what I'm supposed to say? What I'm supposed to do? How I'm supposed to obey God to walk in the Spirit? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you will... Seek God. Approach God. Read the Word. Pray in the Spirit. Worship God. Come to church. Do the things that you know to do. Yeah. And put God first. Seek God first. Mind the things of the Spirit. He will guide you. He will yeah. lead you. Yeah. And you don't even have to understand what He's telling you to do, what to say. Just do it. Just say it. And you will be walking in the Spirit. Yeah. And He will be able to help you. And you'll have life and peace. When everybody else is falling apart and losing everything, even if they're strapping you to a pole and greasing you up to become the next nightlight, you'll have life and peace. Amen. In fact, what you might do is, I'm going home, I'm going home. Like Paul said, this light affliction. I wonder why Paul was able to say light affliction. You know, how many times did he stoned, beaten by rods, shipwrecked? I think he died three times. Imprisoned, famine, chased by lions, chased by robbers, chased by fellow church people, chased by country, fellow countrymen. And he just gets, oh, this light affliction. I wonder why it was a light affliction. I think he was walking in the spirit. I'll leave you with this verse. 
Psalms 46.1 says, God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our refuge. God is our strength. But now notice, a very present help in time of trouble. How far is the Holy Ghost when I'm in trouble? How far is the Holy Ghost from me when I get hit with trouble? He ain't far. He's always present. I may not recognize He's there, but even when I recognize He's there, He's still there. He's ready at any moment to step in, and He wants to preemptively deal with what's coming. If we'll just be led by the Spirit. Now, what business do you have to do? Any business of? Oh, okay. Okay, we're Pastor's going to come receive an offering, but as soon as we're done, you know, service is generally dismissed, okay? I know I went over, I apologize, I'll give it back to you tonight. But I know there's a lot of people who are dealing with stuff, because we're dealing with stuff. He's trying, physically, to hit us with stuff. Amen. And if you would like prayer for healing, anointing and prayer and agreement that you're healed, now, even if you're standing in faith believing that you're healed, come on. don't come up out of faith. Come, come up in faith and we'll yeah. add our faith in the anointing with your stand of faith. Yeah. 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 But what we want to do is have the pastor take up the offering and then we have, we're going to have a general dismissal, meaning if you need to go, you're not going to offend me or anybody. But if you'd like to stay, you're welcome to stay. And then we're going to open the altar up very, very quickly to come up and Susan and I are going to lay hands on you for healing. Amen? Amen. Did anybody not understand that? If you didn't understand it, ask the Holy Ghost. He'll help you understand it.